qualities that describe a farmer. Peter, you want to say? Well, I think farmers are hardworking people. They are very resistant. Uh, a lot of things are working against them, but they are stubbornly sticking to the land, and I think that they're good people. Uh, risk takers. Um, farmers um, face weather risks. They face biological risks. They face financial risks. I mean, can you imagine if the people in this room, if our paychecks depended on whether or not it rains? Um, they are hungry people. One of the sad tragedies of the world is that 75% of the poor people on this planet are rural. Most are engaged in farming. Most of the hungry people on this planet are actually members of farm families. And they are increasingly women people. As, as Ms. Merrigan said, uh, there is an increasing feminization of agriculture that we ignore uh, at our peril. Farmers are good economists. They make very logic decisions, and this is what we always miss. We think of farmers as subsistence farmers. They are not. They buy, they produce and buy, and they participate in the market. And they also need security. They need good governance for them to develop. Thanks. So I want to get back to this point about women farmers, which was just touched on right before we um, took the stage. So we know that women farmers make up 8% of the total global population. So 8% of everyone on the planet are women farmers. But in the developing world, only 10 to 20% of land titles are held by women. So Peter, I'm going to start with you. What do you think can be done to shift this uh, balance to, to talk about land tenure rights for women? Well, first of all, as you say, uh, there are many farmers or women, particularly in developing countries, well over half of farm labor today and food is grown by women farmers. As you say, women farmers don't have good access to land. They don't generally have their names on the titles. And on top of that, both women farmers and men farmers in developing countries are facing a tremendous wave of land, land grabbing by, by northern corporations and by foreign governments in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, who are taking 10, 20, 30, up to 100,000 hectares at a time for biofuel plantations, for exports to be produced other places, and they're driving farmers off the land. And many of the farmers they're driving off the land are women farmers because bad policies trade liberalization have caused the prices farmers get paid to drop below the cost, the, 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 the level of subsistence. And so men have had to migrate and seek work off the farm, leaving women doing most of the agriculture. And now they're being driven off the land co completely by foreign land grabbing corporations. So we've got to stop land grabbing. We've got to uh, look for community titles to land because individual titles are too easy to lose. Uh, people get tricked into credit schemes use their land as a, as a collateral and lose their land. When we have community land tenure schemes, we find that women have better access, although they do have to struggle against patriarchy in, 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 in customary land arrangements, and families in general have more security in terms of their land tenure. You guys want to add anything? I, I just completely agree that security of land tenure, especially for smallholders and especially for women, is, is one of the chief policy requirements uh, that we face. Um, women and smallholders in general simply are not able to invest themselves in the land without security of land tenure. There are no magic bullets or magic beans, to use a less violent metaphor, uh, to solve all the problems of agriculture, but, but some of those beans are better than others, and security of land rights uh, is clearly one of them. Great. Um, talking about land, uh, land degradation is a global issue, uh, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Friday, I'm sure most of this room knows it, is the International Day of Soil. So, uh, FIM, it, it seems like soil's finally on the global radar. People are talking about land degradation. They're talking about soil conservation. Um, I know you work a lot in this field. I don't know if you want to talk about that, particularly in terms of uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, we, we're currently doing a study on the economics of land degradation, and uh, this global study is giving us very interesting results. The first thing is that we computed the cost of land degradation, and that cost of land degradation is a loss of ecosystem services, not only the financial losses on the ecosystem services. Now, one thing which we find is that 25% of that, the cost of land degradation 
is uh, coming from Afri Sub-Saharan Africa, a region which is uh, smaller than the, the other regions. And majority of that losses are actually coming from the, the cutting of forest and all that. And we try to divide the types of losses. There are losses which are incurred at the farm level and others which are incurred off the farm. Carbon sequestration, for example, if you cut down the trees, you are losing the carbon sequestration that uh, the world is uh, benefiting from. 68% of the loss that are occurring are off the farm, and only 32% uh, are on the farm. So the land degradation problem is a global problem. It's not only uh, a local problem or a farm level problem. Now, majority, we looked at the drivers of the land degradation, and one thing which was very, very, very consistent was that governance. Improvement of governance has led to less land degradation, and also good markets, market access, also reduces land degradation. So there are very large practices, uh, there are very large policy issues and policy implications on preventing land degradation and uh, ensuring uh, sustainable land management, including uh, improvement of governance, improve, improvement of uh, the market uh, access to market, which encourages farmers to do best. A very good example is uh, the Kenyan. The, there is a, a study which was done, which is very, very famous. More people, less soil erosion. Now, that less people, more, um, more people, less soil erosion was because those people were very close to the market, and that's why they had the incentive of preventing land degradation and improving land productivity. Peter, have you seen um, any positive movements in land degradation in Mexico? Well, I think that the main cause of land degradation is, is uh, the unsustainable industrial agriculture model, uh, bringing into small farm areas uh, the production of monoculture instead of diverse cropping systems, the use of herbicides, which mean that there's no cover on the ground, and so when it rains, the soil is washed away, uh, herbicides promoted and sold by one of the sponsors of this event, I might add. And I think the solutions are in the hands of small farmers and peasant farmers around the world. Traditional farming. Uh, practices as well as the science of agroecology shows that by diversifying uh, cropping systems, by having the ground covered with vegetation at all times, by incorporating organic matter into the soil, by not using toxic chemicals and herbicides, by not over mechanizing, we can actually rebuild the soil. And agroecology shows, uh, has shown us that you can have the most degraded soil in the world, but you can recover it with agroecological practices. As, as Ephraim said, of course, farmers need to have a, have a possibility of making a living through farming. They have to have a market, they have to have a good price. But if they have that, and if they're not uh, having the industrial models shoved down their throats by, by corporations and banks, and they have the opportunity to rediscover some of these traditional practices, they can be very productive and they can actually recover the soil. And we've touched on markets. Um, access to markets, I think, is something that most are aware of is a problem in many parts of the world. And there are barriers, many barriers. Some are physical, some are political, cultural. Mark, I know the, the bank has worked in this area a bit. Yeah. What do you think can be done for farmers? Well, we've already mentioned one, which is access by women to, to, to land and security uh, of, of land tenure. But access to input markets in general, uh, financial markets getting access, especially for smallholders, especially for women, to, to credit, uh, to, to seeds, to other agricultural inputs. Um, sometimes the barriers are logistical. I mean, poor roads to, to, to rural areas. Uh, sometimes the barriers are legal. Uh, not only is it difficult for women to have secure access to land tenure, but simply to get credit because they don't have secure access to land tenure can be a barrier. Uh, Ms. Merrigan mentioned that if women only had the same access to inputs that men did, uh, in East Africa we estimate that productivity would go up 20 to 30 percent, uh, resulting in 150 to 200 million fewer hungry people, I mean, uh, 20, 25 percent fewer hungry people just by giving women the same access. So that's, that's locally. Uh, and then internationally, uh, there are uh, trade and non-trade barriers that discriminate against developing countries. Um, all countries are, are, are guilty of, of having uh, a trade barriers. And if we could solve those public policy issues, 
um, we could use agriculture better to help reduce poverty and create a more prosperous planet. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to talk about market barriers to access? Uh, we did a study at, F, uh, at IFPRI, and we're looking at uh, the, 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 uh, the investment that can lift people out of poverty. Mm -hmm. And uh, access to roads was one of the most important um, uh, factors that can lift people out of poverty. And also, in terms of education, uh, again, Ms. Merrigan uh, said a very good thing, that educate women, you're educating the whole family, and you're lifting more people out of poverty. We are seeing that, actually, if you educate the women, you find the, the, peop the, the, the children, they are better educated, and they also, uh, the, the, their nutrition <coughs> is better than if uh, you don't. I'd like to step in on trade barriers. Uh, I accompany the world movement of family farmers and peasant farmers, which is called La Via Campesina. It's 200 million farm families in 79 countries. And the Via Campesina says that one of the biggest obstacles to local food production and farmer well-being is precisely trade liberalization and free trade agreements. So it's not that countries have too many trade barriers. It's that, and with all respect to the World Bank, it's that they, they, they don't have enough trade barriers. When countries protect domestic food production, there's the possibility for prices to rise for small farmers and peasants to have an incentive for them to able to use agroecological farming practices, them to, are able, they're able to produce healthy food for local communities, and they're able to have a life with dignity. And so one of the big problems for food production locally in different countries, what we call food sovereignty, is precisely too much free trade. And so we can have a much better food system if we relocalize it. Uh, yes, I, I would disagree with that. Uh, we saw with the food price spikes in 2000, 2007, 2008, um, we saw the number of hungry people go up to over a billion. And one reason that so many more people went into hunger was because too many countries put barriers on the exports uh, of, of their food to countries that need it. Um, many countries have been guilty of this in the past. I mean, the U.S., of course, have had uh, embargoes, uh, soybeans to Japan, and and wheat to the former Soviet Union back in the 70s and, uh, and early 80s. Um, but it was the absence of free trade that really threw a lot more people uh, into hunger uh, in 2007, 2008. I don't think we're going to find an agreement here in our <laughs> remaining 10 minutes. <laughs> to change the topic a little bit, um, technology and innovation are, are keys to the future of development, particularly in agriculture. In the telecommunication and healthcare sector, we've heard a lot about leapfrogging technology. Um, this is being done in agriculture. Um, Mark, I don't know if you want to talk about potential in this field, projects that you know of. Yeah, we in agriculture, and I say this as an Aggie, we are so far behind uh, other industries in, in using 21st century technology. If you look at what's happened in transport, if you look at what's happened in energy, alternative forms of energy, um, we've certainly made a lot of progress in agricultural research, but compared to other industries, we don't have our electric car. I mean, we need leapfrogging technologies. At the same time, we have to have today's technology better delivered to, to especially smallholder farmers. But we need much more agricultural research, and I say that not just because Ephraim represents a consultative <laughs> group on international agricultural research, but especially research that is better directed to crops and cropping systems of most interest to poor farmers in poor countries. And we especially need much more research that into climate smart agriculture. Um, what is happening already in Africa, in the Indo-Gadgetic Plain, Ms. Merrigan mentioned what's happening in the western part of the United States. We see the effects of climate change at work and we really need much more and better investment in the kind of climate smart technology that can give a triple win for farming that increases productivity, increases farmer resilience, and sequesters more carbon in the soil. And who should pay for that research? Um, there is definitely still a role for the public sector. I mean, agriculture research is a public good, a global public good. Increasingly, private companies uh, are taking uh, a large, spending a larger and larger share on agriculture research, but not enough. Again, is going into the kind of crops and cropping systems where most of the people, most of the farmers uh, uh, need to have it. And for that, there is still a role for the public sector. Anyone agree? Disagree? I disagree. I think, I think <laughs> that the, 
that the, the top-down research and development system now with increasing participation by the private sector is, produce, is providing farmers with very expensive technology that's very unsustainable from an environmental point of view that locks them into monocropping in, in volatile markets and farmers will be much better off with diversified farming systems with agroecological technology that's in their own hands. Our research has shown that the highest adoption rates of technological in innovations come when farmers themselves lead the process of experimentation and rescue and recover some of their traditional knowledge along with modern knowledge from, from, from agroecology. And, and we have this, this problem that the whole research and development system now is being, is being driven by the private sector and it's causing very dangerous things from a public health point of view, from an ecological point of view. And, and I have to say that, uh, that being at a food seminar sponsored by Monsanto is like being at a community p a policing seminar sponsored by the Ferguson Police <laughs> Department. I didn't know <laughs> Monsanto was a sponsor of this event when I was invited. I already had my plane ticket and I'm really sorry that a, co that a corporation that's doing so much damage to farmers and consumers is sponsoring this event. If we, if we skip before we were talking about Monsanto, um, Ephraim, what do you think your parents would make of this, of this conversation? Your parents who were farmers um, and, and technology and the role of farmers in developing their own technology. But can, can you give me a minute of also <laughs> contributing to this? Uh, let's look at this, uh, that in only 20 years, the farmers in rural areas in Africa, 20 years ago, they were not using cell phones. Today, 70% of the population in Africa, they are using cell phones. What's the magic that they had, the, this cell phone company, the Steve Jobs, had, which we don't have, to have agriculture, to have technologies of agriculture adopted at, at that rate? What's, what's the, the, the reason behind? Are the cell phones not cheap? They are very expensive. But why are the farmers taking them up? Much faster than the improved varieties of seeds. What's the, the logic behind? It is not the governments which are investing into those cell phones, private companies. We have to live with private companies, but they have to be regulated in a way which they are not going to be profiting on, 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 the, on the backs of the farmers. Now, coming back to your question about my life and what the, my, 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 my people back home where I grew up would make up of this uh, conversation. As I said in the beginning, farmers are very good economists. And I'm gonna use my mom because women are talked about a lot. We grew up on a farm which was only five acres. Now my mom had a lot of kids, 16. Now, for her to feed all those mouths, she had to make very economic, very good economic decisions. The first thing is, the, the kids have to work very hard. I woke up at five in the morning every day before I go to school. I have to go do weeding. I come back, I wash my feet, and I go back to, I, I go to school. When I finish school, the school dismissed, my mom would be standing just beside the, 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 the school, calling me to go fetch water from a, a river which is one mile away. I did not have time to play. I did not have time to enjoy the sleep in the morning. I had to work very hard. But look, she educated me, and I'm not speaking to you here. She had a very good investment into education. She had to make very hard decisions, but one thing which motivated me to work and uh, do this is that, why are the farmers so poor while they work so hard, just like my mom and my family? It's because there are so many other constraints that need to be taken into account, including good governance. A, a good example, for example, DRC Congo has been one of the most poorest countries in the world for the last five years. But 30% of carbon stock in Africa is in DRC Congo. 25% of fresh water is in DRC Congo. Why is this country starving? with abundance of the resources. Look at other country, Botswana. This country is in the middle, middle income countries, but it has almost nothing. It's almost a desert. What's the difference between those two countries? Governance. That's a very, very important aspect which needs to be taken into, into account. And governance comes with other very big things. So if my, my farmers back home in my village would be listening to this, 
they will say, give us good governance, give us good market access, give us good policies which will help us to grow and uh, prosper. Hi. So um, there's one question here about uh, infrastructure. Maybe somebody can talk a little bit about, so moving slightly away from the farm, what, what do farmers need in terms of infrastructure? Sure. Who wants to take that one? The infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Let me go back to DRC Congo again. To move food from East Congo, Lake Kivu area, to Kinshasa, where there is very big demand, the farmers need a plane to fly to, uh, to, to, to fly the food. Even low quality, low, I mean, low value crops like maize, beans, they have to be airlifted. What, what's going on? That's really a very, very bad thing that is not gonna help the farmers to develop unless we have very good infrastructure, the, the, the marketing infrastructure for them to be able to, to, to grow and compete with the open uh, uh, market, global market, which uh, we are seeing. So that infrastructure is very, very important investment. As I said in the beginning, our research at IFPRI is showing that you invest in rural roads, you are leaving more people out of poverty than many other investments. I think Ephraim makes a good point about rural roads. And, and one of the problems we have is that road networks in most uh, poorer countries are from agricultural areas to ports for exporting. Yeah. But as Ephraim said, they're not to the, where, the, where hungry people are in the same country. So we need a different kind of infrastructure. We need community-based food reserves. We need community-based food uh, seed banks uh, where people can uh, have control over their own food system and, and make sure that when there are price shocks in the global economy, they still have food at hand and that they have access to the local market, not just to the global market. Any last words, Mark? Yeah, I guess uh, I wouldn't want to leave this panel without saying that my own view is that we really can't afford to, to waste anybody. I mean, I had an organic banana for breakfast this morning. And I have no doubt before the end of the day, I'll have something made with corn oil or soybean oil made from a Roundup Ready corn or soybean. Um, we need all players. And I wouldn't demonize Monsanto any more than I would demonize Via Campesina. I mean, I, mean, I talk to people from Monsanto. I talk to people from Via Campesina. These are good people trying to do good things. And to say that there is one magic bullet or magic bean, I think, really misses the point. We, we need the full spectrum of, of people trying to do good things, and, and we need events like this that actually bring the different perspectives together. And um, it's only by working together that we will not live in a world where 800 million people are going to go to bed hungry tonight, and that should be intolerable for, for all of us.